In The Great Divorce, hell is depicted differently. Hell is a sprawling suburb, a grey town full of shabby shops and greasy little streets. A number of characters in this grey town get on a bus and take a day trip up to heaven. Lewis himself, who's the narrator of the tale, is one of these day trippers. So he's positioned himself in hell at the start of the tale. And we'll see later uh, what happens to him as the story progresses. The story of The Great Divorce is a dream. Lewis presents us with various characters who, in his dream, face a choice after death. Will they advance from hell up to heaven and enter deep heaven? Or will they, having looked around the outskirts of heaven, decide they don't like it and go back to hell? Now, this does not mean at all that Lewis believed in a real choice facing real people after real death. It's just a conceit, a way of exploring moral choices, a way of depicting why some people prefer hell and some heaven. He calls the book The Great Divorce because he's playing on another title, The Marriage of Heaven and Hell, by the romantic poet and mystic William Blake. The Marriage of Heaven and Hell, which Blake wrote in about 1790, consists of a series of paradoxical aphorisms in which Blake turns conventional morality on its head. And in his preface to The Great Divorce, Lewis remarks that whereas Blake wrote of the marriage of heaven and hell, I have written of their divorce. There's no way that hell and heaven could ever be married. As St. Paul writes in the New Testament, what partnership have righteousness and iniquity? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? These pairings, these couplings are fundamentally incompatible. And given that they can't both be had, one of them must go. A choice has to be made, a painful choice. As painful as the choice to dissolve a real-life marriage. The epigraph to the book is interesting. Again, it's a quotation from George MacDonald, as with The Problem of Pain, and this is how the epigraph goes. No, there is no escape. There is no heaven with a little of hell in it, no plan to retain this or that of the devil in our hearts or our pockets. Out Satan must go, every hair and feather. That's the choice. Do the souls visiting heaven from hell wish to retain some particle of the underworld, however small? Or are they ready to completely abandon such hopes and enter heaven? Given the painfulness of the choice, it's perhaps hardly surprising that the visitors from hell nearly all fail to make the right choice. Because if they choose to stay in heaven, if they choose life, they're choosing death. They're choosing the death of their old familiar selves. In retrospect, if they make that correct choice, no doubt it will appear to have been the best decision they ever made. But when the decision is still to be made, it looks very unappetizing. The Great Divorce tells the stories of ten visitors from hell, only one of whom makes the right choice. Not everyone in the grey town gets as far as the bus queue. Not everyone who joins the bus queue gets on the bus. Not everyone on the bus gets off the bus when it reaches heaven. Not everyone who gets off the bus meets an angel. Not everyone who meets an angel is actually recorded as being spoken to by an angel. Only ten characters do, and only one of these has an encounter which leads to salvation. Just the ten. And whether Lewis intended an echo of Christ's healing of the ten lepers, only one of whom was thankful, it's hard to say. I expect he did. The more you read Lewis, the more you realise that there are no accidents in, in, in what he wrote. These echoes are not there casually. We don't have time to look at all ten characters, but I'll focus on just two of them. 
A man with a lizard on his shoulder, a lizard of lust, who whispers constantly in his ear, and also a more mysterious tenth leper, that we might call him, whose identity I'll come back to at the end of the talk. The lizard man is, is a very interesting character, and the killing of, of his reptilian lust on his shoulder comes at the climax of a long conversation between him and the angel who is guiding him round the outskirts of heaven. These are the final exchanges between the, the ghostly lizard man and the bright spirit who's encouraging him to let go of his lust. Have I your permission, said the angel to the ghost. I know it will kill me. It won't. But supposing it did. You're right. It would be better to be dead than to live with this creature. Then I may. Damn and blast you. Go on. Can't you get it over? Do what you like, bellowed the ghost. But ended whimpering, God help me. God help me. The next moment, the ghost gave a scream of agony such as I never heard on earth. The burning one closed his crimson grip on the reptile, twisted it while it bit and writhed, and then flung it broken-backed on the turf. The lizard dies. The lust is destroyed. And in its destruction, it is transformed into a glorious stallion, which the man now rides, as previously he had been ridden by his lust. Out Satan goes every hair and feather. The lizard man's face, we're told, shone with tears. But it may have been only the liquid love and brightness, one cannot distinguish them in that country, which flowed from him. It was good that the lizard man had tried to make himself more lovable by leaving hell and visiting heaven, but he has to learn that his own good intentions aren't enough. He needs help from the angel. He needs outside surgery. Lewis says somewhere that it was only after he'd made a sustained effort to obey his conscience for about a year that he realised he couldn't do it in his own power and turned for help to Christ. Likewise, the lizard man must realise that his hope of gaining admittance simply on his own terms is a hope which he has to relinquish and replaced with a, a better hope, a more realistic hope. Above Dante's hell in the Divine Comedy was a sign which read, Abandon hope, all ye who enter here. We might almost expect to see a similar sign over Lewis's heaven. Abandon hope, all ye who enter here. That is to say, abandon all your natural human hopes. Your natural, regular, ordinary desires of self-improvement, self-control. You need to submit to the control of your creator and your redeemer. And that is a bittersweet exchange. Tragy comedy was Lewis's preferred term for the genre of the human story. And that's precisely what we see in this story of the lizard man. Our most joyous festivals, Lewis wrote, speaking of church worship, center upon the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Our most joyous festivals. And there is thus a tragic depth in our worship, which can't and mustn't be avoided. Our joy has to be the sort of joy which can coexist with sacrifice. And what the lizard man does in The Great Divorce is just that. He acknowledges the need for sacrifice. He acknowledges that it would be better to be dead than to live with this creature, this lust, any longer. And so by embracing death, or what he thinks is going to be his death, the lizard man actually takes away the power of the lust which has been controlling him all this time. And as a result, he enters unexpectedly into the rose-red brightness of heaven. The Screwtape Letters also ends with a character entering heaven. 
Because the patient, the man that Screwtape and Wormwood are trying to tempt, dies in an air raid during the Second World War at the close of the book. Screwtape writes furiously to Wormwood about this, explaining what the patient must have experienced at the point of death. This animal, Screwtape says, this animal, this thing begotten in a bed, could look on him, meaning God. What is blinding, suffocating fire to you is now cool light to him, is clarity itself and wears the form of a man. You would like, if you could, to interpret the patient's prostration in the presence, in the presence of God, on the analogy of your own choking and paralyzing sensations when you encounter the deadly air that breathes from the heart of heaven. But it's all nonsense. Pains the patient may still have to encounter, but he will embrace those pains. The saints would not barter them for any earthly pleasure. All the delights of sense or heart or intellect with which you, you Wormwood, could once have tempted him, even the delights of virtue itself, now seem to him in comparison but as the half-nauseous attractions of a rattled harlot would seem to a man who hears that his true beloved, whom he has loved all his life and whom he had believed to be dead, is alive and even now at his door. So the Screwtape Letters ends with the absolute rout of Screwtape and his minions and the triumph of the patient's joyful meeting with his true beloved. This is a marvellously comedic conclusion from one point of view. But it's not simply comic. Notice also how, for the patient, there may be pains in heaven, pains that he will embrace. Yet again we see Lewis depicting the heart of reality as tragicomic. As he writes elsewhere, the whole cosmic story, though full of tragic elements, yet fails of being a tragedy. Christianity offers the attractions neither of optimism nor of pessimism. It represents the life of the universe as being very like the life of mortal men on this planet, of mingled yarn, good and ill together. That phrase about the mingled yarn is a quotation from Shakespeare's play All's Well That Ends Well. The Screwtape Letters ends well for the patient, if not for Screwtape, Heavenly bliss wins the day, even in the context of a World War II air raid. Interestingly, the Great Divorce also ends with an air raid. But this air raid has an entirely different result. It doesn't send the protagonist off to heaven, but drags him out of heaven, at least out of the outskirts of heaven, where so much of the dream has been set, and deposits him, we're talking about Lewis, the narrator, deposits him back in war-torn England in a cold room, hunched on his floor, the clock striking three o'clock in the morning, and the air raid siren howling in his ears. This protagonist is Lewis himself. He puts himself into the story, as I said, and he doesn't come out of the story very well. Not only has he been found at the start of the story in the grey town, but he's not very dissimilar from the other inhabitants of this hellish place. When he gets on the bus in heaven, we're told that he glanced round the bus. I shrank from the faces and forms by which I was surrounded. They were all fixed faces, full not of possibilities, but of impossibilities. Some gaunt, some bloated, some glaring with idiotic ferocity, some drowned beyond recovery in dreams but all, in one way or another, distorted and faded. Then there was a mirror on the end wall of the bus. I caught sight of my own face. And there's a similarly self-critical passage later on in the book when Lewis has reached the outskirts of heaven and his guide says to him, There have been men before now who got so interested in proving the existence of God that they came to care nothing for God himself as if the good Lord had nothing to do but exist. 
There have been some who were so occupied in spreading Christianity that they never gave a thought to Christ. Moved by a desire to change the subject, dot, dot, dot. Lewis is not the hero of his own dream. Rather, he ends up shrieking, I am caught by the morning and I am a ghost. And this is typical of Lewis, who is always ready to notice how moral questions come home to roost. There's only one soul for which you and I are responsible, and that is our own. We have no grounds for complacency. So the narrator of the great divorce, Lewis himself, wakes from his dream hunched on the floor next to a black and lifeless fireplace, which is an image of damnation. There are no glowing embers in this grate, nothing that can be fanned back into flame. And there's no comedy in that, certainly. But there's no tragedy either, interestingly. Just blank, meaningless waste. Because tragedy, in Lewis's view, is the unavoidable. But hell is avoidable. We don't have to go to hell. The doors of hell are locked on the inside. What is truly unavoidable, what is truly tragic, is the pain involved in sanctification. That's the tragic element of the tragicomic destiny that awaits the saints in heaven. Getting to heaven involves a process which is both harrowing and hallowing. It's a process that involves death and rebirth, just as Christ's redemption of the world involves both his crucifixion and his resurrection. And absolutely crucially for Lewis, the rising from the grave of Jesus Christ does not cancel the reality of his dying on the cross. Rather, it transforms it and reinterprets it, but it doesn't pretend that it never happened. I think that Lewis's vision of Christianity could hardly be better summed up than by that moment at the end of John's Gospel, when doubting Thomas meets the risen Lord, whose body still bears the scars of his passion and death. It's a beautiful risen body, but the tokens, the, the glorious tokens of his passion are still visible. Jesus says to Thomas, reach here with your finger and look at my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side, and do not doubt, but believe. <laughs>